Okay, there, we're recording, so go ahead and read the script, Andy. Okay, this is a script for remotely conducted open meetings. Confirming member access. As a preliminary matter, this is Harbor and Shellfish Advisory Board. I am the chairman, Andy Lowell, to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. State each member's name. Shall I do that now, Peter? Um, um, I or should I jump up to the introduction? I think you just read through it and then do the roll call. Okay. Uh, staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Anticipated speakers on the agenda, please respond in the affirmative. Introduction to remote meeting. Good afternoon. This open meeting of the Harbor and Shellfish Advisory Board is being conducted remotely, remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020, due, the, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless, unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment for for this meeting, Harbor and Shellfish Advisory Board is convening by video conference via Zoom app as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. For Zoom meetings, please note that this meeting is being recorded and that all attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and to take care not to screen share your computer. You hear me all right? Yep. I can hear yep. you. Okay, thanks. That anything, was... anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Meeting materials. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless I know otherwise. Meeting business ground rules. We are now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members inviting each by name to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name, please, before speaking. If members wish, wish to engage in conversation with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself, please. For items with public comment, after members of the board have spoken, the chair will afford public comment to those members of the public that have joined the meeting via Zoom. Members of the public who wish to speak must state their names and be acknowledged by and speak through the chair. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by a roll call vote. Hey, Dave. I see board member Dave Bossy. Confirmed? Confirmed, present. All right. Uh, Tom, you still there, Tom? Yep, Mr. I'm here. Sadlowski, there you are. Yep. Thank you. Peter Brace, our secretary. Yep. Thank you. And uh, we have our town biologist for 
The Natural Resources Department, Tara Riley. Yes. Where'd you go, Tara? Yes, I'm here. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'd like to call this meeting to order. Did you see Dave Franzuto? I did not, no. He's there. All right. Welcome, yeah. Mr. Andrew Andrews is listening. Hi, everybody. All right, Dave. Confirming that you're here, Dave? Yes, sir. All right. And Ginger, by phone? By phone, yes. I'm here. All right. Wow, thanks. Okay. So Dan's out fishing. He won't be joining us. Uh, glad you all could make it. Uh, this is the Harbor and Shellfish Advisory Board, June 16th. I'm now calling this meeting to order, if that's uh, correct protocol so far, Peter, please. Yep, yep, you all, all right. yep. We have, did we have draft minutes out February 18th? Yeah, and you know, it's been uh, three months and I haven't gotten them done yet. <laughs> okay. So I'll, I'll get to them. All right. I have no update on the Shellfish Association. Peter, if you'll add Brooks number, we may get some more participation from Brooke because she, uh, she did state that she wants to, uh, you know, stay on top of our meetings also. So, uh, well, which, which would be very good. Yes, Mr. Brace. That's before the meeting, like five minutes before the meeting, I, I checked to see if she was on our agenda um, email list and you're right, she wasn't. So I added her and then I sent her an email and said, Hey, if you, if you're around, you want to join us. So she might chime in. Okay. Thank you. And uh, did you have something to say about our Zoom protocol for, for the foreseeable future? Um, it just seems like it's going to, this is the way it's going to be. No one has, at least Erica can't tell us that, that you know, it's going to change. Um, and me personally, I'm thinking, yeah, I, don't think it, I don't think it changes until we get vaccinated. So it's something we got to get used to. Hmm. Either that or it runs its possible three-year course or more. So, uh, okay. Well, uh, if you hear any word of, uh, you know, I, I mean, we're so sparsely attended, I feel like uh, we could still meet in person and keep, keep safe distance. But uh, uh, I don't know how the rest of the board feels about that. But... Uh, this should work out too. We'll see how this goes. Anybody on board from the Marine Department? No, she's not here yet. She's not here. Okay. Uh, then I'll introduce Tara for natural resources. And before uh, you jump in, Tara, I would just like to uh, uh, mention to the rest of the board that uh, you deserve a, uh, uh, to be recognized in a positive way for, you know, traveling through our desolate streets in March and April to keep the, uh, the lab up and running. Uh, you know, a lot of town employees had to stay home, but you are not one of them, I'm imagining. Am I correct? You're correct. Thank you. I appreciate that. It was a uh... It's been really, really busy. We, um, we started back in January um, getting the hatchery going and then things really cranked up in March. Um, we had probably half staff at that point due to you know various people traveling and different quarantines um, that they had to, to undergo when they returned. But um, we had our first hatchery oyster spawn in March on the 17th, um, which we um, created millions of vied larvae that we set on scallop shells for um, Leah's oyster reef restoration. Um, and our goal every year for this program has been to set around 250,000 oysters on these scallop shells. And this year we've done um, two spawns and we've already set around six million oysters on these shells. So we're pretty happy with that. Um, in addition, we've also done around, I think a million 
um, oyster singles, which are just oysters that someone might use for like the raw bar. Um, we were just kind of playing around with our systems and seeing what they could do. And um, we ended up um, being pretty successful with it. So those oysters right now are in our flow through systems outside. Um, and then again, I guess like a week later in March, we did a quahog spawn and that spawn um, resulted in 5 million quahogs that are probably, I think they're about almost two millimeters and those are outside in our tanks as well. Um, so we're pretty happy with that. Usually we buy around 200,000 from off island to, to stock our waters with. So this year, um, assuming, you know, they all survive, you know, we'll have quite a bit more to put in our recreational waters for, for people to shellfish on in, in later years. Uh, We've had three scallop spawns so far um, that happened pretty early. And so when they happen that early, you can't really put them out into the harbor. Um, they're just not gonna grow. There's no food in the water. So what we did is we experimented with setting them in our systems inside of the hatchery. And then we also put them in some tanks inside the hatchery with spat bags in them and let them naturally attach to the spat bags. Um, and we actually just put those out in the harbor today. So we have these spat bags with base gob larvae attached on the inside that are going to be growing out in the horse shed. Um, the goal is to get them a little bit bigger and then kind of shake them out all over the eelgrass out there and see, see how they do. So that's something we've never done before. Um, we released 14 million base gob larvae along Monomoy shores. Um, from the second pier on up to the Shimo area. And that was done, I don't know, maybe like three weeks ago. And so right now uh, we've got about 40 million day six larvae that are in the hatchery and we have five more spawns scheduled. So things are going really good in the hatchery. Um, I think this is probably one of our best production years that we've ever had. Um, Jeff you know, keeps asking why it's so good with like hardly any staff. And I think it's just because we don't have a lot of distractions. We don't have a lot of people in and out of the hatchery. We don't have a lot of meetings and stuff going on. So we've really been able to kind of fine tune our systems and our protocols and take the time that it probably needed to be kind of worked out and played around with. Um, so we're, we're pretty happy with that. Uh, we have four out of five of our interns that have started. Um, we had one start, two of them started in April and then two started on Monday. And this year we're all kind of sharing the endangered species monitoring for the department and getting trained on, you know, monitoring the piping plovers and the birds from Vince um, so that we can, you know, do that in the way that it needs to be done. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys heard, but the, the DMF came in um, and did water quality and they issued a closure for Shimo Bend where Leah's oyster project is. Um, yeah. They classified it as prohibited. So basically that means that we're not allowed to put anything into that oyster reef anymore. And we're also not allowed to take anything out. Um, we weren't taking anything out of there, but we were wanting to continue to restore it and put, you know, juvenile shellfish on shell and that sort of thing onto the reef. Um, and right now they're saying that there's no way that could happen and they need to come in and do more water quality testing. I, I can't remember how many consecutive tests they need that need to pass in order for it to be open, but they said it's probably going to take two to three years. Whoa. So that what are they, what's coming up in the test? Um, it, they're saying it's fecal coliforms. So, you know, we're, we're kind of, we're having a hard time with the DMF right now. And it's something that our department's discussing. Um, sometimes when they come out, they come after like a big storm event and that's not an ideal time to get a picture of what the water, what's going on in the water. And they also don't really like coming out here. <laughs> so um, hmm. to get the frequent testing that we need to keep things open is very difficult for us. 
Um, we've offered to take the test for them. We've offered to have the environmental police take the tests um, just so that there's, uh, you know, full disclosure on, how, you know, nothing's being tampered with and they will not allow it. So we're trying to figure out some ways that we can work with them so that we can get some of these areas opened. They also um, classified the hatchery um, as in a prohibited area as well. So it's closed from the Great Harbor Yacht Club to Brant Point. And so basically what that means for the hatchery is that we're still allowed to put out shellfish, but it has to be smaller than 25 millimeter. Um, so if we wanted to basically hold shellfish or store it under the dock as we do, um, basically that's not allowed. And so one of our goals for this year is to see if we can get at least the hatchery omitted from that closure. It seems like they're doing some like micro closures and including different areas. And so we're just trying to see if there's a way that we can get that the hatchery cut out so that we can you know, be more versatile in what we're doing. They also said that they can classify an area as prohibited based not not based on um, fecal coliforms alone, but if there are moorings in the in the area, or if there are a lot, there's a lot of boat traffic, which is seems kind of silly to me. But um, so those are like some of the issues that our department's looking at, trying to rectify and 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 fix for hopefully this season, and if not, you know, into next season, and see what we can do to fast track some of that stuff to get it back open again. Um, Tara, do you think that the Shimo Ben has something to do with the the shells piled up? I don't think so. The Shimo Bend area they said was due to fecal coliforms. They didn't specify, you know, whether it was from septic systems or birds or you know whatever. I I don't even know if you can tell that, but um, it just came very abruptly and we didn't get any heads up about it. So that's why we're just kind of like, what's going on? Did someone call the DMF and complain about the project? Or like, it just didn't really make a lot of sense to us. So we're, you know, trying to figure out exactly what happened with that. I've had a lot of people ask me about the outfall pipe from the pump at Children's Beach. And I realize it's uh, mainly dealing with stormwater. Yeah. Uh, some people don't understand that. I certainly hope that it wasn't some type of whistleblown for a reason that your department wouldn't even know about firsthand. Um, but can you think of any other added man-made factors that could be bringing these numbers up, resulting in these closures, uh, other I'm than not something. Sure, because there's also like, I guess there's a tiny little creek off of First Point on Co2, and they also closed a little tiny area there too to shell fishing, which is, I mean, there's nothing on Co2. So, you know, what is the closure for? And, you know, I just, maybe they came in and just took a bad batch of samples, you know, after the storm. Yeah, maybe yeah. Everything Mr. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Ginger. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, uh, there's a, an outfall pipe from, uh, or I don't know if it still exists, but there was an outfall pipe from uh, Pest House Pond uh, there at the end of, just, just east of the end of Cathcart Road. Okay. So uh, Pest, Pest House Pond has definitely had some nitrogen issues, I, I think, in the past. But uh, there was some talk of uh, closing, uh, you know, closing that pipe and, and getting rid of the interchange between the salt and fresh. Uh, and there are several large houses around Pest House Pond and in that watershed, so I don't know. Okay. That, that, that outfall pipe it's gone through some some flux from time to time and it, it, it got cleaned out and it was working well. It, maybe it's clogged, I, I don't know. But it's a, it's a fairly large um, concrete or whatever they make, whatever they make pipes out of. 
clay or concrete is a pretty large pipe. And it does it does come out of that pond and it runs across that beach. So maybe there's something there that maybe there's something that, and, and if and as you pointed out, Tara, if they came right after a storm event, th that's like shooting yourself in the foot. Yeah. I mean they, they, they have closures after storm events on a routine basis. Right. Just because of that reason. And if you sample um, right after a storm event or a heavy rain event or whatever that washes the the effluent into the pond or into the, you know, you're going to get high counts. Yeah. Doesn't, um, yes, Peter. During the, when we always had the annual closure of, of Madigan for, uh, you know, July through December, I remember reporting that, that it was, it had to be three, three clean samples in a row, right? Isn't that right, Dave? I think you're right. When, when terrorists, so three, three jumped in my mind for some reason. And I, and I, I think that's right. You know, but, you know, Matic, it's open now, but, but you're right. We would have to, we would sample in late summer, early fall, and then get three clean samples, and then you were able to open it up. Right. So we should we should know that. We should get that confirmed, and then go back to them. Two to three years. I mean, that's kind of crazy. Thing things are different now. The closure that you guys are talking about, you know, was right when I started, and I remember going out with the water quality person from the DMF. Then it was Neil, and we would he would come over because he liked coming over and we would get those samples done quickly. And we actually got Madikit open. So there wasn't the seasonal closure. Right. Right. Um, but now staff has changed at the DMF and everything's been like completely shaken up and they are not, they're not allowing anything. And they're, they've given us the impression that the samples need to be taken, but by them and only them and very spaced out. And won't the oysters help make the samples better? Sure, they fil they filter some ungodly amount of water every hour. They will, yeah. but I mean that's a project that was like five years in the works, and it's still in the works. You know, we're learning a lot. Some of the oyster reef had sunk, and we wanted to like really build on it. And so now it's kind of like a cease and desist order. So you know, there's not much we can do about it right now. It seems like such the perfect location for it too. And you've put so much yeah. effort into that. Right. Yeah. Leah and, uh, you know, the whole crew there at Natural Resources, seeing some of the pictures of, of how that has evolved has been tremendous. Now, you mentioned earlier, Tara, uh, you know, there's a lot of comorant activity on CO2 and I've actually gone by when they roost and uh boy you gotta roll your windows up um and uh this is totally you know outside but uh there's been a lot of seals on the beach in Wawinet, and uh you can't go by them because they're beyond where the posts are uh where you get off the beach from great point to Wawinet at the hall over there but as you Traverse the road towards Wawinet, uh, the, the same thing from the seals being on the beach on the other side of the dune, uh, had to roll up the windows. It, it was so bad. So there are some natural causes out there too. I wish we could blow a horn or something and maybe get the comorants to, to move elsewhere. Maybe Ginger could, uh, could, uh, uh, add to that, but, um, other than that, no, the, the activity on CO2, other than there's been a lot of high tides this winter, very high moon, moon tides. Um, and, but gosh, that, that pond on First Point has always been a great uh, cherry stone location. Always seemed to be a healthy pond, having that uh, deep channel into it. But, uh, I'm sorry to hear. That's awful news. DMF being Department of Marine Fisheries? Um, correct. Okay. 
uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, Ginger. The uh, the cormorants uh, move year to year. Yes. So uh, the, the really intense uh, nitrogen loading uh, in the colony when they're when they're there, and uh, that's pretty unique to have them on the beach the way they do the way we do. Mm -hmm. However, uh, what happens is when they move to a new location, uh, uh, we get more vegetation. Yes. So uh, it might just be a temporary thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can, um, Peter. You want more information on the cormorants out there? The person that talked to was Neil Foley at, at uh, the Conservation Foundation, and he's now a full-time employee there. But before that, and I think the last three or four summers, he'd been the Kotu Ranger. Yes. And he he did his his PhD work um, on the cormorants out there. Okay, interesting. All right. We just lost Shay, Shay Fee has that position now. JC? Shay Fee. Oh, Shay Fee, yep. Uh, John Fee's daughter. Yep. I met her the other day. She's uh, going to be great. doing all all the bird monitoring and she will be the go-to ranger for this season. Looks like we just lost Tara. Dave Fee's a great kid. Yep. Yes. She's yeah, she really seems really like it. Kid. Yeah. All right. Well, if Tara bounces back, we'll thank her for her. Got her. I got it right here. All right. Any questions from the board or comments from the board for Tara? Nice job, Tara. Yeah, I got a, I got a question. Peter? So all this time, the, the hatchery operating where, where it was, DMF knew where, DMF knew where the hatchery um, was, knew there were boats there, knew that probably aware of the issues and all of a sudden they're giving you crap. I don't understand. Uh, I mean, on our permit, it says that we're just not allowed to like put out any shellfish greater than 25 millimeters. And last year was the first year that we grew stuff bigger. Mm -hmm. And we we're like, we wanted to be able to donate mm -hmm. shellfish to fundraisers or people that were raising money for us. And they were like, no way you can't do that. So we had all these shellfish that we couldn't do anything with and i mean that would be our goal for the future is to you know be able to donate shellfish for those purposes or you know perhaps do some restoration with larger shellfish we just can't right now okay there has never been as far as i can remember for 30 some years there has never been a bad water quality sample taken by brand point okay. it's, 20, it's 24 feet deep for god's sake yeah. it's and it flows twice a day like there's no four times a day like there's no tomorrow so yeah we said that we said that to them and then they said that they can close it because of moorings in the area so i guess the sailboat moorings are a problem for brant point right and that that corner of that mooring field is dedicated to clarence um, the well, indian Tara. and alarian yeah. fleet it's all sailboats Tara, Tara, when so this is hampering what you may put out at your dock. Does it uh, have a negative effect on what you're doing in the lab? Aren't, aren't you bringing water in from around the corner of Brant Point? Um, I mean, yes, we are. Were they were they concerned about the water that you're taking in? No, I think they were concerned about. I don't know. I think they're concerned about the amount of shellfish maybe that we're starting to produce now. I don't know. Like there's just some weird things going on with the DMF right now. And you know, the closure to us on a water, if it was a water quality reason, I could understand it, but just because there's happens to be a few moorings off of our dock just doesn't make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay. Well, Chairman, Mr. Franzuto. There, there are two commercial marinas and an entire mooring field 
in in Stage Harbor, which isn't any wider than a hundred yards, and their hatchery is right there in that corner with a pond dumping into it on the northeast side of it. So moorings and boat traffic and and activity and all that, it's baloney. It's that and I can see Tara's frustration. But in Stage Harbor in Chatham, their their hatchery is oh and incidentally right next door i mean i mean sharing a bulkhead is a boat ramp so what she's saying is about not understanding it i can totally understand that that frustration you got to be kidding me wow oh, boy Tara, is hickey still at uh, dmf um, I don't think he's the point person anymore. I'll have to find out. All right. Um, all right. That, that, I just thought when she was talking about the moorings, I, I, I was trying to come up with some logic. And that's where Chatham's hatchery is, is in Stage Harbor, with that activity going on around it. Well, if there's somebody new there who's in charge, and it's not my kicky. Right. And they're recently on the job. Right. He might be looking at what Mike did and said, okay, we're going to do things differently. We're not going to be as soft on them on this town or that town. And we're going to come down and show them who's boss. And that they, might be what's happening. Dara, do they give you the numbers from, from their testing the, you know, parts per million or how, whatever, however they measure the, the contamination. Yeah, we did ask for the dates that they were sampled and what the levels were. And I think that um, they were sending those to Thais, who's our water quality specialist. And and can you have, can Thais take samples of her own and for a comparison, even if it's off the record? Yes, I think that is the plan. And we're going to have the sewer department run the tests for us. It will coliform part and just so that we can have some comparisons, whether they recognize them as you know legit or not, I don't know. And I, I was trying to look at a bright side to uh, our economy shutdown and the whole COVID thing. And I was I mentioned this to Peter when we were doing the agenda to specifically ask you, Tara, um, if uh, you know somehow make sure we keep last year's water quality testing records, you know, at hand and, you know, try to do the same type of testing this year and see if there's any measurable difference uh, with what may be uh, a large reduction in harbor use this year. And uh, I mean, so far we're seeing a huge reduction in the use of the harbor by, uh, the Fagawi race being canceled, 4th of July is now canceled, uh, uh, and just look out at the anchorage, and uh, it's very sparsely populated with small boats. Um, so I, I'm just wondering if we could do a little, you know, testing of our own uh, to see if there's a measurable difference in, in the, the reduced use in the harbor uh, Possibly having some positive results in our water quality. Uh, yeah, we're, I mean, we do the same protocols in the same sample sites um, every year, so they definitely will be comparable. Um, we are, you know, anticipating, you know, some differences because of the decreased use, but also we are interested because, I mean, Monomoy was lit up in April, you know, people were there that normally aren't there along that shoreline. And so the septic systems were probably more in full swing than they are, you know, usually. So we're interested in, you know, if the water quality was affected by that increase of pressure too, from people just coming earlier than usual. Wow, wow. so there you go, another aspect. I didn't think of that. Uh, and but uh, one I did think of well they're certainly not cutting down on uh, keeping their lawns green 
So, uh, but uh, no, yeah, there's, uh, I know my neighborhood started filling up right away at the end of February and, and every week it's returning on and houses around here and, and the same for on our shorelines. So, okay. Anything else for Tara, board members? If not, thank you so much for joining us, Tara, and you're certainly welcome to stick around. And, uh, you know, something else may come up, but if you're busy with the kids, you may check out also. All right, thanks. <laughs> next, time, next time you gotta bring snacks. All right, I will. <laughs> All right. Um, moving forward, uh, old business changes, possible changes to regulation of liveaboard boats in the harbor. Um, you know, until we meet with with uh, some staff member from Marine Department, we're not really moving forward with this. So uh, we'll be hopeful that uh, we can pick this back up in the near future. Board members, thoughts, discussion? We have to. Yeah, have Mr. Chairman, that, that's, that, I guess that's all we can do until we can. Yeah. All right, well, I'm gonna make a point to, to uh, talk with Sheila and you know, see if she can delegate it out, uh, hopefully, you know, maybe to Christy now, uh, her deputy. Uh, so we'll see where we can, we can go with that. Okay. Um, collection and containment, or was there any more discussion, other board members on the liver board regs? Okay. Collection and containment of hazardous materials. Uh, obviously, I've just enjoyed this time off, so really haven't done anything except for asking uh, Brooke to uh, send out her latest rendition of the uh, dumpster bunker bumper stickers. And uh, I, she said she'd do that, but I don't know. Has anybody received it? No. Picture of that bump. Okay. No. All right, so uh, I'll reach out to Brooke also. Public outreach and education. Hey, Andy. Yes. So I went, down, I went to Hazardous Waste Day. Yes. Saturday, the line was really long. So oh, I, good. So it's heartening that people are, um, are holding on to their stuff and bringing it in. And for the, for the rest of you guys who you know, I didn't tell this about a month ago, I was walking, my walk took me through the Pulpus Harbor access point that's across from Diane Pearl's house. And I happened to notice in the little place where you back your car in to turn around in the, sh in the, uh, in the brush next to the salt marsh were these two large, I mean, just huge plastic containers full of waste oil, just sitting right there. They held, they held cat litter is what they held, but they, you know, there were, you know, at least three and a half, four gallon containers clear full of waste oil and then all kinds of trash in there. So I, when I get back to my car, I drove back to the lot, picked those things up, picked up all the trash, but the, but the, you know, the, the marsh is right there, 20 feet away, a high tide in that area gets wet, you know, <laughs> it was crazy. Mm. Doesn't make but, sense. But anyway. Ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Peter, thanks for doing that. I know on the outer shores over the years, I've picked up five gallon buckets of waste oil and I, I guess fishing boats are allowed to throw it overboard. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't think so. No, no, Dave, no. <laughs> okay. They all proudly display a little placard that the Coast Guard gives them when they inspect that they won't do that. Oh. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I know years ago now years ago we we all used to do that but that was right. practice but right not anymore 
No, now it's mounted in your engine room. You got that. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But, yeah. Okay, what about their garbage? Are they still allowed to throw garbage overboard? They're just, you know, no, no, no. They have to, no, waste. They, they're, no, there's there's a little there's a little disclaimer on the bottom of that inspection sticker that they get that, that they can't throw anything. Over. Yeah, that's right. Hmm. Well, good to know. Good to know because uh, we sure have still have plenty of garbage floats up plenty. on the beach. Yeah. All right. Um, anything else on that? Other board members? Andy, is, is your article for the uh, containment building going to be, it, it's, it's moved forward, right? Non-essential. Non-essential. Okay. So, yeah. Among the non-essential. So, <laughs> but there's some big numbers there to be concerned with. I don't know if you all noticed, but uh, uh, which, you know, I'm not against it. I'd certainly want to see the upgrade, but uh, the uh, sewer main to go from C Street to Surfside Treatment is 32 million they're asking for. So to get started on the, the design of that and construction, they're estimating 32 million for a pipe three and a half miles long. That's quite something. Uh, I just, I don't know, I made a weird comparison because I was looking at uh, uh, the, mem the uh, folks running for the select board and uh, uh, the incumbent, why it's from the coffee shop. Um, Jason Bridges said uh, he thinks it would be tough for the for the public to swallow 50 million for the island, a new island home. And when I saw that 32 million for a three and a half mile long pipe in the ground, I thought, gosh, <laughs> what's the, you know. Priorities. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, hey, if, if we can do one, we can do the other. So let's just keep spending. But anyhow. On public outreach and education, um, I was glad to hear that Ashley Arisman is very interested in, in working a program in the high school with high school students. Uh, my wife was speaking with her about it. I still have not spoken to her about it, but uh, um, uh, I'm looking forward to, to doing something with that. So I'd like to keep talking about it. I was also... Uh, uh, reading about the one-time use plastic ban in that's gone into effect, but will not be enforced at this point. Uh, I guess, you know, understandably so with, we can use COVID for a host of uh, excuses, but anyhow, uh, the town has a public outreach uh, person on on the payroll so i'm going to make it a point to try to uh get in touch with this public outreach officer and and uh see if i can have a discussion and and where we can go with with uh hazardous waste type things and and uh the fragility of our waterways and shoreline and and uh see where we can go with that so um I'm hopeful. Oh, mi Ginger? Mr. Chairman? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is slightly off topic, but maybe public outreach is, is it, it sort of comes under that. I was out walking at Smith's Point, I think, right, right before or shortly after the uh, uh, emergency order was declared, uh, before, before the stay at home part of it anyway. It was a Wednesday, and it looked like uh, somebody had come and tried to tried to dig up every clam at the West End. Um, Sunday, I went to Eel Point uh, with my clamming fork and noticed that uh, there there were so many holes in the marsh. It was unbelievable. I I found one clam about an inch long, and that was it. So. Uh, 
uh, my 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 response was, was that really necessary? Um, I, I think that that was when we started to uh, have a lot of visitors from uh, uh, New York and Connecticut and various other hotspots, and uh, I just I, I felt like they. I mean, maybe it was local people. I don't know, but I felt like somebody had come in and just emptied the place and um, and left. So. And, well, certainly a mix of both both locals and seasonal residents. I noticed a lot of activity in the uh, uh, you know Washington Street extension to Montemoy and, and the Creek area. Uh, we had several. Uh, extreme low tides. Uh, I was visiting with the Otisons and noticed quite a bit of activity one Sunday uh, in the creek area for clamors. Uh, the, the Which hole- was actually closed. Right. And, and the, ho- the holes that you noticed, Ginger, were they using the, the rake or a shovel? Uh, well, let's see. I don't remember offhand. I, I mean, I didn't see rake marks, but there there were an awful lot of divots. Holes, holes dug way. with a tool. Yep. All right. I, I mean, hasn't the plunger thing taken off? Aren't, aren't most people using a plunger to clam now? Oh, I don't know. It's been so long since I've been out. Well, I'm just wondering if this could be part of uh, public outreach on that. I can remember going with my dad as a child, and he always got down on his hands and knees with that short little rake that had tongs on it like uh, walrus tusks. And, you know, every <laughs> other every other one that he hit, you know, was broken. And, uh, and I was out many years later with a friend of mine uh, who used a plunger, and he put a broomstick on the plunger, and on the other end of the broomstick was a little crafted wire basket that he made. So he never even had to stoop down. And you see hmm. the you see the breathing hole in the sand, and you plunge it, and it pulls the clam up to the surface, and then you scoop it up with the other end of the handle with this little basket. And uh, I, I was so amazed and impressed by that, Mr. Bossy. Is that or Mr. Franzuto? Um, that, that, Tara, did you hear what Ginger said about all the holes and digging and stuff on Sundays? I did. Okay. Could you pass that on to JC? Yeah, no problem. That'd be great. That's, that's, unfortunately, that's my, my public outreach for that is let the shelter warden go out there and raise hell with them on Sundays. I, that, that's a question I should have asked Tara um, during her talk, um, was were you guys, is the Natural Resources Department worried that there's so many people out there? I mean, all they had to do was look on Facebook. Everybody's posting the clams that they're digging. Um, mostly it, it seemed like it was, it was cohogs and you, you know, the, the, you'd see the, the postings of the cohogs they got, and then in the evening, the stuffed cohogs. And, and I know that we have way more cohogs than we have soft shell clams, yeah. but uh, still, I'm just wondering about the impact on the fish on the two fisheries, you know? Yeah, I mean, people, people aren't working, so they're shell fishing more than, more than, more than ever. Um, hopefully, it's recreational. I, you know, I don't know if people are needing more food these days in the form of shellfish or not, but. Um, yeah, I know JC is out there. I know that um, the soft shells are very popular. So um, I'll follow up with him and see if if he saw any of those posts. And I'm I'm just wondering that since it's only on Sundays and the season ended this past Sunday, does the um, shellfish warden see people on the following Sunday not knowing that that was? I'm just. Yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll, if there's a carryover, that's all. And and numerous times throughout my time here, kayaking around in the summertime, I've seen families with a boat gathering every shellfish that's in the water and bringing it home. They're bringing home scallops. They're bringing home whatever they can get, not knowing or knowing and not caring. That's all. 
Yeah. Usually the the Sunday following the closure is usually a, a busy Sunday. Oh. Just just because they 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 they're not aware yeah. of the date. That's what I figured. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Dave, you're just a wealth of information. I like that. I'm just full of I'm full of baloney. Based on history, <laughs> based on facts and history, Tara, um, I'd like to go backwards just a little bit. Uh, do you know anything about the progress or not progress of uh, the proposed Pierre and Shimo? I do not know the update on that one. All I right. apologize. Does CONCOM meet this Thursday or a week from Thursday? That is a good question as well. All right. <laughs> it, 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 it's, All right. it's on a Wednesday that they meet. Oh. And I, I, I think they had, I think they had postponed the discussion of it until there could be a live meeting, until it oh. could be in person, I think. All right. That would be good to know. Yeah, I would hate for that to fall through the cracks. Jeff said CONCOM is next Thursday. Uh, so I thought they met on Thursdays, Peter. Huh. Um, because I saw the notices in the paper, but I didn't see the date. Uh, because there's a couple of things coming up in my neighborhood. But anyhow. Uh, all right, because that is certainly, I mean, it, it certainly, you know, couldn't slip under the radar, hopefully not. Um, uh, I'll reach out to Jeff some more on that. And Tara, if you continue to uh, represent natural resources, you know, if you're able to come up with, uh, you know, any, any updates on that for us, it's certainly appreciated. I have a meeting tomorrow. I'm sorry? I have a meeting with Jeff tomorrow, so I can check on that for you. Great. Awesome. Okay. Um, you know, the more I think of it and the, the, the boat traffic and the, the young kids that learn in little boats over on that shore that I've witnessed over the years, it's just, you know, aside from the environmental standpoint, there's a huge safety factor in, in this pier also. And uh, so certainly something I think we've all stated how we feel about it. I think we all probably still feel the same. Uh, and uh, so we'll keep this on our radar for sure. Uh, moving forward, if there's nothing else on public outreach, Board members, uh, Shab's issues for the Coastal Resiliency Advisory Committee to tackle. I can tell you that we are, uh, we just had our first meeting um, in three months this morning. Um, the RFP for the consultant that will help us write the Coastal Resiliency Plan has been put out there. It's being advertised. I think it so, yeah. been said it's advertised until the end of the month. Mm -hmm. So um, nothing, no movement on that. Um, and then all we really did was during the meeting was finalize the language of a recommendation that's going to go to the board of selectmen um, on which um, on uh, which numbers sea level rise numbers that the town needs to refer to um, what we what we've been working on is to try and realizing that the plan will be ready you know for maybe a year and a half two years that issues are going to come up with development um, stakeholders service people um, any number of things along the shoreline where permits are going to be needed from regulatory boards and they got to have some something to refer to on what Nantucket subscribes to for the amount of sea level rise is going to be between now and 2100. And so we're going with, I believe we're going with the, um, with the NOAA or the, I think we're, we're going with the FEMA numbers and the number that we're going with is four to six feet. Um, but 
we're also supposed to come up with some sort of recommendations um, for like the planning board and the CONCOM and the HDC that they can sort of use as guidelines to follow along when an application happens that's gonna be within the area that's gonna get flooded. And we're not done with those yet, but we worked on that recommendation today for the selectmen about the, about the sea level rise, which numbers to refer to, which numbers are the standard in the town. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah, that this boy got a whole lot of aspects to cover and a whole lot of vulnerable areas to, to think about. But I also wanted to say that there's been, there's been, Vince was saying, and I think Mary Longacre, our chairman, was saying, there's been a lot of people sort of grousing, I guess, that, you know, we're dragging our feet or it's taken too long to create the plan. And meanwhile, the water is coming up. And uh, both of those guys said, you know, they basically, to deflect that, had to say, well, you know, we've had the COVID virus and we haven't been able to meet. Um, we're doing the best we can and we have to follow them. RFP process, which takes a while, and um, so, so well, so lighten up, Rome, I guess. Yeah, Rome wasn't mm -hmm. built in a day. These things take time. I don't see how anybody could expect uh, immediate results from a fledgling group dealing with uh, an unknown. I, I mean, yes, tides rising even i'll admit that but you still don't there's a lot of unknowns so uh uh it, 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 you can't just come up with answers nobody's dealt with it before there's no history on Mi it so. mr chairman ginger yes um my my perception possibly erroneous but um i have a feeling that um there are quite a few people uh, with uh, property in the vicinity of wet that uh, feel that the Coastal Resiliency Committee is going to solve their problems for them. And right. I, I don't believe that that can uh, or should be done. Mm. But uh, that there's a there's a false hope there that uh, that somehow resiliency means resistance mm. rather than resiliency. Well, um, good, point, through, good point, Ginger. Through you, Mr. Chairman, back to, you. to Ginger. Um, we've had numerous people come to our meetings, um, and when it was time for Paul McComet get up and say, "We're we live in this area, and we're what can you do for us? We live in Brant Point. You know, I can't sell my house because people see what's coming. Or, you know, what are you going to do about the Children's Beach boat ramp pump?" Well, um, there was an item on the, um, there was a prop two and a half item on the ballot today that's going to do something about that, I guess. But um, that's the thing, you know, we're, we're in the in-between now. We're creating the plan, but things are going to happen along the way that the public is going to come to us and say, um, hey, you're, they're going to misinterpret what we're all about, thinking that we're going to solve the problem when we're just creating the plan and then eventually administering it. So, wow. Um, well, lucky you to have to deal with that type of a reaction. <laughs> uh, I never would have uh, anticipated that, that, but people are accustomed to being saved, I guess, by, by higher authorities. I don't know, but that's too bad that you have to tackle that along with try to think about you know, logically and reasonably what can be done. So well, it's, it's nothing nasty. People aren't rude, you know, but it yeah. is, it is, a, it is a form of pressure, mm -hmm. you know, a form of stress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, now that you know it, try to shake it off. Yeah. Peter, cause we appreciate your representation there. Peter, the uh, pump is not an essential item for the, meeting this time though so i don't know what it means for us to vote on all these overrides but they're not going to be approved by the tenth by the town meeting right it's currently being repaired right now they've got the old pump out right on the street for everybody to see that uh 
Robert B. Our companies down there, uh, I, I was under the impression they're putting the replacement pump in, and that was already approved to, to be paid for. Mr. Chairman, I've, I've gotten numerous phone calls about, on a whole other subject, of that temporary pump block in the boat ramp. Yes, people, yes. People can't, you can't back a boat of any size. You can't turn a boat of any size to get it back down in there. And, and it's unfortunate that they elected to put that thing in the second lane there. Yeah. Well, with the low, I haven't talked to David Gray about that. And I, I figured that would be an issue. I, you know, that's part of my morning waterfront cruise and, and, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, the location of the manhole that they're pumping out of now to keep the area dry where they're trying to work on installing the new pump, uh, that's what I am imagining is what's taking place there. Uh, and it really is, if, if they have no parking along, I think if you, you know, I, I, I don't think that access is as hampered as some may feel it is but it for, is, big, for big boats it is yeah it is temporary and hopefully you know they move along with that uh so it's not there all summer long but uh you know this is part of our infrastructure um i'm glad it's at least being worked on and hopefully rectified after <laughs> years um We've got a lot of a lot of infrastructure here that needs repair, so we've got to tell people to be patient with it, and it's not going to last forever. I just hope it's uh, resolved and uh, not adding to these water quality testing problems because where all that water is coming from, there's a, a large volume of water comes out of that pipe. Uh, there at Children's Beach, and uh, as far as I know, it goes back as far as the Nantucket Hotel, if not uh, Lily Pond, uh, you know, that Gull Island Lane uh, area that... Lily Pond is correct, Mr. Chairman. Is it? Yeah. yeah. I believe so. Mm -hmm. I, I think that there was a pipe and there was some discussion from... Um, uh, the DPW about uh, cleaning it out or possibly uh, making Lily Pond more of a pond. I'm I'm not sure what they decided. That the the uh, the wetland next to the road on West Chester Street is can actually considered a drainage swale rather than a, uh, a part of the Lily Pond. Although mm -hmm. there's um, it's taken a beating. Well, anyway, it's a, that that little that water I call it a water retention area, uh, but it's been wet for so long. It's really a wetland, and uh, a lot of uh, street water, storm water runoff ends up in there. You see it silted over, and I just wonder if it hasn't silted over so heavy that now that it's just remaining a pond, it used to dry out. It would after rain events, it would be full of water. After a couple of weeks, it would settle down and sink below the surface. And now it's just uh, a constantly full, full of water, a lot of silt, a lot of uh, windblown garbage from job sites in the area. It's, it's really a shame. It's disgusting to, to drive by that every day and see the disrespect that, that takes place there and, and in so many other areas. But... Uh, a little off subject there, but anyhow. Well, hopefully. no argument for me there, that's for no. sure. Yeah. I, okay. Anything else on the coastal resiliency? Anything in old business board members want to discuss? We'll move to new business, summer meeting date. Uh, here we are. Uh, this is our second day of uh, our second Tuesday in June. So our next meeting uh, would not be till July 7th. Uh, how does the board feel about one meeting July, one meeting August? Feel pretty good about it. Mr. Franzuto. Um, I'd love a meeting 
that 7th of July if we possibly could because the 21st of July I'm headed back south. Okay. Mr. Sidlowski? It's good for me. Works right. for me. Me good. too. Mr. Frace, July 7th, only for July. Yep. Ginger? Uh, that's fine with me. Um, I, I could probably make one if the 21st seemed appropriate or if we wanted it, if we needed an emergency meeting, but uh, I'm okay. happy with the 7th. All right. Well, we'll discuss it again on the 7th. Meantime, okay. we'll uh, pencil it in as uh, July 7th is our next meeting and only meeting for July unless, uh, unless we change our minds. And Mr. Chairman, okay. do, we, do we want to do um, the same thing with August? Start with Mr. Franzuto. Oh no! Don't 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 worry about me. I I won't be back until the thirty first of August. All right. Well, I, will, I spent will you the be... first three months of COVID in North Carolina. I'm going to spend the last three months of COVID in North Carolina. But see, Dave, with the with this uh, Zoom approach, you don't have to be here. That's yeah. you know that's a good you know <laughs> that is a great point. I that's exactly right. I. I will be there. You send me the notice, Peter. That's a that's a great point. That's a a benefit. Yeah. Don't have yeah. to see how handsome I am. Yeah. You, can't, you, can't yeah. run, you can't run away down to North Carolina and say, "Oh, I'm going to be down soon." <laughs> no, that, that's a great point. Thank you. Thank you. That's I, that's perfect. I'd much rather see you guys. All right. Well, good. <laughs> well, uh, Peter, if you want to put in August fourth, and and we'll we'll do we'll just we'll bring this up again at our next meeting. Okay. All right. That'd okay. be great. Sound good to the rest of the board? Yep. Sounds good. Right. Yes. Thank you, Ginger. Uh, so also under new business, we've got Great Harbor Yacht Club, Nantucket Land Council, Marine Grants Committee, twenty twenty grant report. And so, as some of you may remember, um, the, the out-of-court settlement between the Great Harbor Yacht Club and the Land Council and 10 scallopers uh, as a, a result of them displacing moorings and destroying um, eelgrass to put their mooring field in and their, their pier resulted in the Great Harbor Yacht Club committing $350,000 over 10 years essentially a $35,000 grant every year that um, could be used by people doing research or whatever that had to do, do with bettering the harbor or harbors. And since that time, I've been on this committee called, um, I have to read it, um, the um, Great Harbor Yard Club, Nantucket Land Council Marine Grants Committee, and it's myself and um, the executive director of, of the Land Council, which was Cormac and now is Emily Molden and Jeff Carlson and Peter Morrison and a guy named Roger from uh, Great Harbor Yacht Club, we can't remember his last name. And then somebody Vandenberg. from- What? Roger Vandenberg. Yep. And then somebody from Mariah Mitchell um, and the grants proposals would, would come in and then we would decide which ones would get the money. Um, and so this is the last year of the grant um, and the money is gonna go toward uh, eel grass, I think pretty sure it goes to help with eel glass, grass planting in the harbor as well as eel grass survey um, in Madigan Harbor. And when that money is dispensed, um, um, then this committee will end and it'll, um, we, at our last meeting, we, we all talked very enthusiastically about, uh, making that committee sort of evolve into a committee of all the collaborators that are working to make the Harbor a better place. Um, and the, and the size of the committee will grow and it'll just sort of be a clearinghouse for all the efforts that are not a clearing house, but um, um, you might say a steering committee of all the all the work that's being done in the harbor, all of the um, you know the storm drains, the eelgrass projects, aquaculture, 
Um, and so Emily Molden is working on how, how that committee would be structured and what our mission would be. And so, that, so that the focus of, because I'm not, I'm not saying it all right, but you know, the Great Harbor Yacht Club has their foundation, which is now geared toward the harbor. They've hired scientists, they've devoted money toward that. Um, you have the efforts of those guys, you have the efforts of the Shellfish Association, the efforts of, of the Natural Resources Department, our efforts, um, and every other person that wants to research in the harbor. And I guess this, this committee would sort of or, oversee all that, if that makes sense. Certainly. Keep, yep. the, keep the focus on making the harbor a better, cleaner. Can't hurt. Yeah. So. Good. Thank you, Peter. Um, uh, just one thing on that. When, when I talked to uh, the Commodore about that foundation, are, I can't remember, Peter, are, are they going to make future funding opportunities available or are they going to contribute, still contribute the thirty-five to $50,000 a year to their efforts of making the harbor? Their, their foundation is going to do their work. I don't know if we'll be getting money to distribute to, to people who are doing research and like doing- Like we did before. Yeah, enhancements. Like the, other, the committee you're on. Right, I don't know if, if money will be coming to us, but I think that's something that Emily wants to try and facilitate. So then we, wherever the money might come from, then we might be able to direct it to the, you know, to the projects that need it the most. Right, okay. Uh, is the aim of that so that it so that I think what I'm trying to say is that there are all these different entities working on one goal which is to improve the water quality and the life um, the sustainability of our harbors and this committee would sort of be corralling and organizing that and keeping tabs on everything that's going on and if any money could come into us then maybe we could distribute that to those guys that are doing the work that's that's what I got out of it. Of course, Emily could probably say that in one sentence. Well, you yeah. wanted to email her. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I could say it; you wouldn't understand me, so it doesn't really matter. Probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anything else on that from board members? Uh, I do like to mention a couple of things. I guess is Tara still with us? I can see her name, but I don't see her. All right. Um, but every time I hear about... Uh, there she know, is. She was I, there. Uh, every, every time I hear about eelgrass yeah. restoration, I think about all the sand that has eroded off of our harbor shorelines into the harbor. Uh, I remember having, you know, not too long ago, we had Cormac at a meeting and Jeff was at the meeting. And we were talking about the eelgrass restoration project and uh, how all this sand has washed off of our beaches and really the eelgrass needs kind of a muddy base to root into. The granular sand that's on our beaches is not a good base for eelgrass to, to thrive in. And then Jeff had mentioned how some mooring handors have mentioned that where they used to set moorings in six feet of water, now they're in four feet of water. And I'm hoping we're not uh, moving forward with eelgrass restoration before, uh, you know, if, if dredging needs to be done before the eelgrass is planted, then are we putting the cart before the horse? Um, so I, it leads me, Tara, I guess for our next meeting, if you could find out from Jeff, because uh, he did tell us in the past that he's working on uh, a dredging maintenance plan. Uh, if he's made any progress on that, uh, maybe what areas may be focused on uh, would be good to know. Uh, any details, I guess, that, that you could share with us on that or somebody from Natural Resources could come in and share with us. Uh, I'd love to have uh, you know, more information on what will be taking place for dredging. And I have one more thing I'd like to mention, but if anybody else wants to comment on what I just said, they may. 
If not, I'll move forward. Uh, during uh, uh, earlier on during the COVID crisis, uh, there was probably more guys than I know, uh, but two specifically uh, gentlemen who scalloped in the past, uh, wanting to get their commercial scallop license again. Uh, and it turns out the department has uh, eliminated files from 2012 and earlier. So we only have files eight years. I guess JC took the liberty to save files back to the year 2000 that are uh, in regards to more or less to his department, which I would imagine were uh, whoever had bought a scallop license since back to 2000. Well, if a guy scalloped in the 90s, ended, didn't buy a license anymore, wants to get back into it, uh, it's hard to have proof that you used to scallop. So JC's, of course, you know, and I, I admire JC, respect him totally 100%. I would not want his job. I've spent some time with him. And I think he does his job very well. Uh, so I would support JC with whatever he asked for. And so there were a couple of guys who were kind of irate. What do you expect me to save my scallop license from 1995? Uh, now I'm expected to go out and be an apprentice. I was hoping to apprentice my sons. Here's photos of me on my scallop boat. Here's my calling board full of scallops. Here's six guys who are still scalloping that will vouch for me scalloping in the in the 90s. That doesn't work for JC. He needs something in writing. Who, who, a who was it? What's that? Mr. What Vaughan? about it? M I was a, I was, a warden, I was a warden in 1990. Who who was the person? Uh, this was Hal Herrick. He he's he commercial scallop and also George Keating. They both uh, commercial scallop. So, uh, but did, hold on, Andy. JC yeah. needs to see it in writing. He needs I, to see, but proof of something, and as as simple as a canceled check or a receipt from from your wholesaler, the fish which, market that you sold to. Go ahead, Peter. I'm sorry, Andy. Which which Hal Herrick got from Glidden's? Yes, he did. Got he got proof. Yes. JC said, "I'll hold off. I'll sell you the license, mm -hmm. but but you got to find that proof." Mm -hmm. And but you know, for, for Hal, a while there, it was sketchy and and yeah. Hal frustrated and angry, and he sent me a text that he sent to JC, and at that point, I stopped helping Hal myself. I was like, "Look, if you're going to treat our shellfish constable like this, I I, I can't." I can't be a part of that. I, a, a discussion like that is to, it's too controversial for me. Yeah, too he can't rigid. treat him. He can't treat him badly. He needs to get the proof. Yeah. But I mean, I I know um, those guys scallop. Mm -hmm. Mr. Token, Chairman, I see like a story. I mean, gosh, just a week before that, you know, there was, Tara was quoted in the newspaper as saying, you know, there aren't many people getting into this industry, and and. Uh, but I guess what I'm trying to do is just share with the rest of the board that this did take place, the situation with the, the records being destroyed, uh, and that this could come up again. Uh, I wouldn't want there to be any type of, uh, uh, you know, angry banter back and forth at one of our meetings. Uh, for a subject like this or any other subject, but uh, uh, I'm glad that it all worked out. I don't. I think George Keating found an old license in his stuff, so he also has proof. But he, he I think he's postponing another year to to get his commercial license. Well, I, uh, I don't know. Maybe there's a Mr. Chairman. Just one, uh, Ginger. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say tax return. You know, if you have a, if you have income, well, and Hal, not your Hal, address. I your... mean, you don't have to keep anything longer than seven years. And Hal said he's lived by that uh, for decades. He 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 discards everything seven years or older. 
So well, uh, the Andrews family kept everything. I guess we're <laughs> we're a little different. Anyway, David, sorry to interrupt. Dave. Wait a minute, Tom. Dave, Mr. Franz Go, go ahead, Tom. All right, you know, Tom. I hear the story, and I don't have as much sympathy as you do. Yeah. I think to expect the town to keep records for an individual for 20 years or whatever it's going to be, when the person understands that if they give up their license, they're going to need evidence to get it back, that's their problem. I'm sorry they're upset about it. But at some point, it's, it's not the town's problem. It, and it shouldn't be the town's problem. I think 10 years or eight years is more than enough. And if you, if you plan to go back in a business that you need a license for, I had a real estate license. If I want to go back in another real estate license, I'd have to prove that I had it before. I couldn't ask the state to say you had a license. I'd have to have proof that I had a real estate license in Massachusetts. So I have less sympathy than you do. I no, feel sorry Tom, for this guy. Tom, you know what? And I, I'm glad you added that because it, I just come out with that sympathy. And until I hear uh, a comparison like you've just made, perfect comparison. Hey, what if I let my driver's license lapse? I have to go back and take the test. Uh, if I let my, my construction supervisor license lapse. Uh, but I have a one year grace period. Uh, you know, I have to do 20 hours of, uh, uh, of uh, continuing education. And, you know, if I don't do any of that, I lose my license. So, uh, we, Mr. Chairman, we, we added this apprentice thing re relatively recently. And I can see where Herrick, you know, here's a guy who, who commercial fished, who is a fishing guide who, you know, spent quite a bit of time on the water. And if he wants to bring his kid in, I think that's good, you know, that's good in generally. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's um, I don't know, maybe I'm more sympathetic also, but uh, I don't know. Well, I'm glad, I, they, I'm glad they were able to find some kind of documentation. And, and I agree with you, Tom, they, they, the town shouldn't have to. Uh, and I'm trying, I'm racking my brain to, to remember how long back I had those green, the green town copy of those mm -hmm. licenses. And, and I, I, I can't remember, but. I do think they should have been, they should be able to take an affidavit from you if you remember. Well, if I, mean, you're, I, think, I think that should be a document that you could write. I mean, if somebody's if, willing if to you do know they had a, If you knew they had a license. Right you should be able to verify they had a license. And, and, if, and if I was, if I was, oh. if I was unsure, let me, let me put it that way. If I was unsure, if it was a name I didn't recognize or, you know, I didn't, you know, but I interacted with those guys every day for five months, yeah. every year. But it's like, you know, I'm glad that I just, my point is I'm glad they found something. They should help themselves. Yeah. And they certainly shouldn't be belligerent to the, the, the staff. Yeah. Well, you have to, two things, you know, that Hal had undergone what was it, a bout of prostate cancer, and he was, um, you know, understandably um, on edge, counting his time and wanting to show his boy, Tyler and Sam, his boys, how to fish and was feeling the pressure and didn't want to make another, you know, go another year and I took the opportunity to email him and say, say this is what we can, we think we can do for you. And he, he was, you know, wanting to get before our board and have us, have us help him. And, and I had to tell him that, you know, once we do get to meet again, it may not be in time for the season and you can come to us. Um, you could come to us and we, we could say, all right, we're going to help you, which would mean a recommendation to the Board of Selectmen, three weeks of advertising for that item on the Selectmen's agenda. And after all that, most likely what would have happened was they'd side with JC and the Natural Resources Department. And I'm sure that Hal would have packed the place with all his friends. And um, But putting all that aside, I'm hoping that the town 
is digitizing licenses. And so if some guy comes back in 15 years and says, don't you remember I scalloped in 2020, should, but I stopped. Should. You're right. You should be able to hit a, you know, a thing for, oh, there he is, Andy Lowell, you know, and there's his license. Well, I'm glad it worked out. Should, yeah, it should be a compromise between, you know, you should keep your own records to, you know, oh, we have those records here. So, whatever. Well, the, there was definitely some conflict in the discussion. Uh, JC went as far as to say that uh, two of the people he used for references would not vouch for him fishing in the 90s. So, uh, you know, I, I don't want to get into this back and forth while well, he said this. He said that, and and uh, I, I left that one alone and just left it up to Hal. I think, really, J.C. bent over further backwards than he needed to uh, on on this uh, receipt from Glidden's. So, but at least you know this is J.C.'s way of doing it versus word of mouth from you know, whether it's Neil Cocker, Carl Sherwin, any of the, the veterans that are out there. Uh, so, but on the other hand, you know, to me, it looked like, you know, a, 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 a newspaper story. Here's a guy who's battling cancer. We're in this COVID situation. His sons are bartenders. They're well known. There's the Cisco Brewers bartenders, and and uh, or maybe one of them works at Lobster Trap also. But uh, uh, they're popular kids. Uh, one of them almost made it to the tall one was uh, you know uh, high school star uh, in basketball. And but anyhow, so so people know who they are, and and. And to me, it was just a, a, a neat, you know, father-son story. Dad wants to share his experience with his boys. And, and, but when he got, when dad got belligerent about having to do a 40-day uh, apprenticeship, uh, you know, Peter and I were discussing this back and forth, thinking, you know, 40 days, uh, hey, it's a small price to pay to go and have this experience with your sons either way. But uh, he was going to completely can his, his idea of doing this if he didn't get his commercial license for November 1st. Now, his boys will be apprenticing with him. And like I say, you know, great cover story, but uh, it all came out okay. This is something I think, uh, uh, you know, Tom has suggested that, uh, you know, some type of word of mouth should be allowed. Uh, so you do have some sympathy there, Tom, because that's something that uh, the, our shellfish constable says, if he were called to task by the state on this, he can't use any word of mouth for, uh, to substantiate his decision. So, so that's why he needs a receipt. It's a and town, something it's a on town, paper. It's a town bylaw. Yeah. He's not, he's not going to get called in front of the state for a town bylaw. No. Okay. All right. Get okay. The board of Selectmen. Right. Uh -huh. Shellfish Advisory Board, but it's a town bylaw. All $50 right. dollar fine. All right. Good to and know. I, I, I can sympathize with JC much as anybody but uh, you know sometimes you know a little well JC also mentioned common sense goes a long way JC mentions a couple of guys from Vermont who have been trying for the past several years to get a license they don't want to go through the apprenticeship either they can't they're not residents in Nantucket and and, and but he says he gets uh, uh, he gets a lot of people pressuring him for a oh, I, I'm sure, oh I, I know but we passed that bylaw for, for residents yeah. in Nantucket because people from Maine and, and, and other, t not really out of state, I don't ever remember any out of state, but I know guys that when we had a charge of scallops, more than happy to come over here from the vineyard or Barnstable or Chatham or wherever. That's why we put the residents. That's how Chatham Bend got its name. That's how Chatham Bend got its name. is right. <laughs> well, uh, uh, so, I'm just glad it worked out. Yeah, know, without yeah. any 
grief, more grief than it already has. I got to burn something for dinner, you guys. Yes. Um, so if there's nothing else, anything board members want to uh, have on the agenda for next meeting that you can think of now? If not, you know, if you think of something between now and then, give us a text. Peter and I will probably be doing that agenda uh, on, if the meeting's the 7th, we'll be doing it on probably the 2nd because we've got Independence Day is on Saturday. So the latest we'll be doing the agenda will be Friday the 3rd or yeah. The town, the town will take the Monday as the holiday, so we should definitely do it on that Thursday. Okay. July so. 2nd, we'll be working the agenda. Yeah. Right? Okay, Peter. If there's nothing Thanks, else. Andy. I'm sorry, Ginger? I was just saying thank you. I, uh, you, you, you made the meeting run very well. I, I, I felt heard and uh, allowed to speak. That was very, Thanks. very Thanks. important. Just Good. wanted you, to say that before we adjourn. You, you, you come up as a green dot with a telephone on it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm right back there in the, in the dinosaur era with you. So well, thanks. <laughs> this, this wasn't easy for me, but it's come out easy. I'm glad it did. I'm glad we're all here and we're all safe. Nobody got sick through this so far. Nobody tested positive or okay, good. Great. Had nothing to test for. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I'll accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. Seconded. Second. All in favor. Aye. All no, right. Hi. No, you 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 have to do roll oh, call. Sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Sidlowski. Aye. Mr. Bossy. Aye. Mr. Brace. Aye. Ms. Andrews. Aye. Mr. Franzuto. Aye. And I myself. Aye. Andy Lowell. <laughs> Motion carries. This meeting is adjourned. Peter, thank you for saying.